I wish we had kids in this church every single Sunday. It, it is. And I wish we had their parents and their grandparents, and I wish we had their friends. There's a lot of things I wish. And I wish that, not for anything personally selfish. I wish it because that means more people would be hearing the word of God. And that's what we need today. We need the word of God being heard by many. Last week, we talked about the restraining hand that is stopping the Antichrist from doing all the evil that the Antichrist is capable of doing. All the destruction that's actually going to come. And we found out that the restraining hand is the Holy Spirit working through the Christian church, working through Christians. Now, we found out, too, that the Christian church is going to be removed. The restraining hand will be taken off the Antichrist. The Antichrist will be revealed, and the evil will abound. Found all that out. We use a term called rapture. But I've looked cover to cover, and I can't find it in the Bible. But yet every preacher I've ever known has talked about the rapture. Talked about the rapture happening. The rapture of the church. The rapture of the Christians. The rapture. Well, in Latin, the word used in Latin has a meaning of carrying off, a transport, or snatching away. Now why don't we call it the snatching away of the church? The transport of the church? Or the carrying off of the church? No, we have to make up a word, rapture. Okay, well the concept of the rapture is in the Bible. And the concept is the carrying off, the carrying off of the church, the carrying off of the Christians. That's in the Bible. But so that we all speak the same language, I'll continue to refer to it as the rapture of the church. And that's when God snatches away everybody. And he snatches us away because his righteous judgment is getting ready to be poured out on the earth. His righteous judgment is coming. And he doesn't want us here. Now, we're going to talk about some of you that might feel different and think different things, but we'll get there. If primarily, the rapture is talked about in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, and 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 54. It's elsewhere, but those are the two primaries. First, God's going to resurrect the ones that have died. He's going to resurrect them. My mom, my dad. My sisters, my brother, many others, grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, friends, all of y'all's relatives, they're going to be resurrected. They're coming out of that grave. That grave will not hold them. Now, at least you think you're just going to sit here and wave as they go by. That's not going to happen. If you are saved... And in two weeks, I'm going to use a term that some of you will laugh at. Truly saved. But in <laughs> that's in two weeks. But if you are saved, you're going to meet them in the sky. You're going to go with them. Your shell right now. How many of you have aches and pains? Things that you wish you didn't have? Yeah, me too. You're not going to have them no more. You're going to have your glorified body. Now that body is really heavy-duty, intensive, because it will last for eternity. Anybody know how long that is? Forever. Anybody know how long that is? I don't either. My mind cannot wrap around the concept of eternity. I can't. I try and try and try, but my mind is not big enough to, em to embellish what that actually means. It means I'm never going to die. I'm never going to be unhealthy. I'm never going to hurt. I'm never going to have a hard time getting out of bed. I am going to be in my glorified body. Anybody excited about that? Well, here we find in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. For the Lord himself, I'm not going to send somebody, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of call of God 
and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are alive and are left will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Is that not the sweetest verse you can actually hear or read? This is an instantaneous transformation. Instantaneous. It's not a process. It's an instantaneous change. We're gone. We're there. We find in 1 John 3, 2, we know that when he, Christ, appears, we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now, a lot of people get this rapture part, the snatching away, mixed up with the second coming of Christ. The message today is not on the second coming of Christ. The rapture happens before that. But they get, get it confused. It says, at the rapture, the Lord comes in the clouds to meet us in the air. 1 Thessalonians 4.17 We're caught up in the air. Christ does not actually put his foot on the ground during the snatching away or the taking up. At the second, at the second coming, the Lord descends all the way to earth Stand on, stands on the Mount of Olives. There's a great earthquake. Find that in Zechariah 14, 3 and 4. It's kind of funny, though. The Old Testament did not teach about the rapture. You'll not find it in the Old Testament. Didn't teach it. That's why Paul said that he's going to show us a mystery. I'm going to show you a mystery. This is in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we'll all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. That's a mystery. That was a New Testament revelation. That was what was going to happen. The dead will be raised. The living will be changed. We should be longing for this. We should be looking for this. We should be praying for this. If there's any hesitation I have, it's because of the unsaved that are left. I want the rapture taken away, the joining with Christ forever, more than anything else in the world. But I also want the ones that you love and I love, the many that are lost, to be saved. So until God sees fit to take us home, we should double down, triple down on trying to get the word of God to the people we love. We have many, many people that love debating the meaning and scope of rapture, what it is. It should be comforting, but people actually get in real theological disputes over it. God doesn't want theological disputes. God's word is plain. God's word is simple. 1 Thessalonians 4.18 says, God wants us to encourage each other with these words. We're to encourage, not discourage. Encourage. But that brings us to when, where, is this going to happen? The timing is all important. Because the timing in relation to tribulation is another big debate. It's a disagreement. It's a problem. It's one of the many issues in the church today because many churches believe different things about the timing of the rapture and tribulation. Many can go to Bible scripture to defend their point of view. But you can do that with a lot of Bible scripture. You can come up with almost any point of view you want. We're told to take all scripture. There are some that like to take some scripture. We've looked, we've looked before at these three things in previous sermons. But there's actually four primary views. There's the 
Pre-tribulation. I'm on board with that. I think I've learned enough that I'm on board with that. This makes the rapture occur before the tribulation begins. Then there's the mid-tribulation. I spent a little time in that corner, too. I spent a little time there thinking that was the right way. Then there's the post-tribulation. I ain't never been there. Don't want no part of tribulation. And then there is a fourth view. It's a pre-wrath. It's kind of a mid-tribulation type compromise. Here's what's most important to know about these four views. It does not matter what you believe. God will pull us out when God is ready. If it's pre, man, I'm hallelujah. And I believe it is. If it's mid, if it's pre-wrath, hallelujah, I'm ready. If it's post, hallelujah, I'm ready. But my preaching and teaching... It will be before a tribulation because I believe that's what the Bible tells us. I don't listen to the other ones. I listen to what God says. And in my heart, in my studies, I believe that we are the restraining hand, as I told you last week, and that we have to go out before tribulation for the restraining hand to be removed for the Antichrist to come. It's the only thing that makes spiritual sense to me. But whether or not you believe that, God's going to do what God's going to do no matter what. We're okay. What's the purpose of tribulation? Why are we going to have a tribulation? Well, we find in Daniel 9, 27, that there is a 70th seven of seven years that is yet to come. Daniel's entire prophecy of 70 years, uh, nine, uh, Daniel 9, 20 through 27, is speaking on the nation of Israel. You know, it's not speaking to us, to Gentiles. That Daniel, those verses are speaking to Israel. Israel. We forget how important Israel is to God. We take all this focus on us and say, we must be God's chosen. Israel is God's chosen. We're by adoption, Israelites, by adoption, but he's talking to the nation of Israel, Israel in these, this prophecy. The time period, he has his focus on Israel. If you look at all the prophecy, it's referring to Israel. This is a special time for Israel. Now that does not necessarily mean that the Christian church will not be present. That does not preclude the church being there. It just says that they're not the focus of that time. Israel is. My question to you is, why would the church be here? The non-saved to be here, but why would the church, why would the body of Christ be here during that time? Primary scripture for this, again, is in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 and 18. And it tells us that all living believers, along with the believers who have died, will meet the Lord in the air and be with him forever. It does not tell us the time. It tells us what's going to happen. We know that will happen. Now let's narrow it down a little bit more to the time. God is removing his people. We find in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, here's what Paul says. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. So the wrath that's coming, God did not appoint his children to have. We're not appointed unto wrath. If we're here during tribulation, we will face the wrath. Not the specific wrath that Israel is going to face, but the wrath of revel or tribulation. The book of Revelation, which deals primarily with a time period of the tribulation, is how God will pour out his wrath upon the earth. It seems inconsistent with God's promise to believers that they will not suffer wrath, then leave them to suffer the wrath of tribulation. Does that seem like something God would do? The fact that 
fact that God promises to deliver Christians shortly, shortly, shortly after promising that we will always be together with Jesus Christ for eternity seems inconsistent. Another critical passage. This is in Revelation 3.10. Oh, you're going to love this. You might even want to turn your Bible to this one. Revelation 3.10. Shouldn't take you long. Flip, 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 flip. Shouldn't take long at all. Revelation 3.10. I always hated when a preacher did that. I was never sure where to find a book. And then I, no, Revelation's easy. It's the last one. You can easily find Genesis and Revelation. Everything else in between, you need tabs. Revelation 3.10. Okay. Look at the promise. Christ promises to deliver us from our hour of tri uh, trial. The hour of trial that's going to come up on the earth. Why is that important? Anybody got a different version? Anybody say something different out there? Or does it say you're going to be removed or uh, going to uh, deliver believers from the hour of trial? Anybody got something different? Endure patiently. Endure patiently. Okay. We are not going to be in this hour of trial. There's two things that can happen, only two. Christ will protect believers in the trials or will be delivered out before the trials. Both are valid. But the Greek word translated from, however, is important. We're not just delivered from the hour or the uh, trial. We're delivered from the hour of the trial. We're not going to be here for the trial to get us. We're not going to be taken out of the trial. We're going to be taken out of the hour of the trial before that trial happens. Last week we talked about the restraining hand. Antichrist is reduced right now. Once that restraining hand's off, the Antichrist is revealed. We're going to miss it. We will miss the hour of trial. That's tribulation, by the way. If the Bible is to be interpreted liberally, or literally, not liberally, but literally and consistently, literally and consistently, not a verse, but the Bible, the scriptures, God's message. Pre-tribulation is the most biblical interpretation. But let me repeat, not everybody agrees. There was a time I would have argued for the mid-tribulation. But I believe in my heart. But what's even more important What I believe does not matter. God is going to pull us out of this earth. The, the saved in Christ will rise from the grave. The saved in Christ will rise from the earth and will meet Christ in the sky for eternity. Everybody agree on that? Timing is not specified exactly. Some Christians have a post-tribulation belief. I've never seen into that one, but they have a post-tribulation belief. But when considering these things, we have to remember, not one bit of this is salvation scripture. We come to that in two weeks. We come to what does it mean to be saved. For this week, we're talking about what we believe to be for these, the timing of events. Most, if not, actually, I don't think you could be a Christian and not believe, at least, well, possibly could be. But I think most Christians would agree that there's three things for sure, whether you're a pre, mid, pre wrath or post, whatever you fall on that, I believe you can agree there's coming a great time of tribulation such as the world has never seen. Everybody agree with that? Tribulation's coming. After the tribulation, Christ will return to establish his kingdom on earth, the thousand-year millennial. Everybody agree? 
There will be a rapture, a catching away, a taking away from mortality to immortality for believers as described in the Bible. Ever believe there's going to be that? A rapture. Not, you know, I'm not talking about the timing here. I'm talking about the act. So we can all agree on those three things. The only real question for most of us is the relationship between that and tribulation. That's the question that most of us maybe struggle with, but a lot of people do struggle with. Of the three, I believe the Bible shows the pre to be the time. But I'm not going anywhere unless I die until God raptures me home. If I die, I'll just wait, patiently wait for him to resurrect my body out of the grave. He'll do it in his timing. But there are some that believe in the post-tribulation. I thought I would give you some of the reasons that they do that. Because there's, there's some. They've got reason. They believe that the rapture occurs either right after or right before the end of the tribulation period. They believe that at that time, the church will be taken up. At that time, Christ will come. They believe that the post-tribulation and the, and the return of Jesus Christ, or the um, rapture of the church and the coming of Jesus Christ, happened just about simultaneously, just about the same time. They believe they're connected. According to this view, the church goes through the entire seven-year tribulation. Roman Catholics believe this. Some of the Greek churches believe this. And many Protestant denominations believe and teach this. They have a post-tribulation view. One strength of this post-tribulation view is that Jesus, in his extended discourse on the end times, said he will return after a great tribulation. So they say, well, he's not coming back to after the Great Tribulation, which is true. He comes back after the Tribulation, and he reigns for a thousand years. Doesn't say a thing about me being here to greet him when he comes back after Tribulation. But they use that and say, no, he's not coming back to afterwards. The book of Revelation, with all of its various prophecies, mentions only one coming of the Lord, and that occurs after the Tribulation. That's when Jesus actually physically returns. Remember, in the rapture, we're caught up in the air. He comes back after the tribulation on the Mount of Olives. He sets his feet down on the ground. Get some uh, Revelation 13 and 20 point to the saints that are going through tribulation. Well, we know there are saints that go through tribulation. We know that the numbers are uncountable, we found out, because John seen them. He said, ask the angel, where did they all come from? He said, they're the ones that were killed in tribulation. They're the ones that come out of the tri in the tribulation. We know there will be many saved. Many, many, many Jewish people will be saved. Many, many will be saved during this tribulation time. And they will be hunted down, persecuted, and killed. Revelation 25 is called the first resurrection. Post-tribulationists assert that since the first re uh, resurrection takes place after the tribulation, the resurrection uh, associated in rapture in 1 Thessalonians cannot occur until then. It's an argument. Post-tribulations also point out that historically, God's people have experienced hard times, persecution, and trial. And that we shouldn't be surprised that the church would go through that during tribulation. Well, I got a problem with that. They're not recognizing the wrath of God to the wrath of Satan. Satan has always brought war against people. Satan has always brought war against the church. Satan still brings war against the church. Sometimes it's called man's wrath, sometimes it's called a wrath, and sometimes it's called Satan. But it's man's wrath, Satan's wrath, that the church has always faced. The church has never faced God's wrath. Never. Not one time. 
Not one instant of God's wrath on the church. The people that believe that we're here for God's wrath are misinterpreting what Satan has done with Satan's wrath. One weakness of the post-tribulation is the teaching we find in Romans 8.1. Those who are in Christ are not under any condemnation. Tribulation specifically targets the unsaved. Many, many judgments. We've talked about that when we talked through, went through Revelation. Earthquakes, falling stars, famines, water, pests. Many, so many deaths it's hard to tell. I mean, billions of people die. If the church was still here, if the Christians were still here, all of these would affect them equally. They would not be able to avoid the earthquake, the famine. They would not be able to avoid the falling stars, asteroid impacts. They would not be able to avoid any of these wraths that are using the earth in such a way they couldn't avoid being killed. But we're told we're not appointed unto that. Tribulationists, post-tribulationists, also face a difficult time explaining the absence of the word church in all references to tribulation. You'll not find the word church anywhere. It's not there. From Revelation 4 to Revelation 21, it's mostly about tribulation. The word church never appears. Post-tribulations have an argument for that. The word saints appears. They said, see, there's the church, the saints. No, there are the saints that were saved during tribulation. Now, would it have been nice if we had a better, clearer, cut answer? God gave us a mind. He gave us the Holy Spirit. He gave us the ability to look at his word. And there's one final weakness in the post-tribulation. There's a, there's a big weakness to it. But that weakness is all, in all the other versions too. Pre, mid, pre-wrath, and post. The Bible does not give any explicit timeline considering, considering future time limits. That's a weakness in all of them. You can't dogmatically say... This is what's happening. I preach to you what I believe to be the truth. We will be taken out because I believe we're the restraining hand that is holding back sin. But that's not dogmatic. That's not a scripture that I can go to that will give you the timeline and tell you that. What I can tell you is all the other things, and I have told you, that the Bible says is going to happen. We're not appointed under wrath. We're assured that we will be saved from that hour of the trial. We are not meant to suffer God's wrath. We suffer Satan's wrath. We suffer in this world. There are many people today that are being killed, being persecuted because of the name of Christ, we're told by Jesus Christ, if you follow me, you'll be persecuted. I'm not saying that we never face that. I'm telling you right here, right now, today, I will never face the wrath of God. God will not allow me as his son to face his wrath. I'll preach that, I'll teach that, and I'll believe that till the day I die or the day he raptures me home. But as I just said a few minutes ago, and I'm speaking now to more than just in our sanctuary, I'm speaking to anyone watching this video. It honestly doesn't matter what you believe of those three or four theories. If you are saved, you will be taken out when God has determined it's the right time.
but I'm convinced you'll do yourself a favor and be saved because you'll miss a whole lot of whole lot of things you don't want to be in. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you give the meaning of your word to the ones that are hearing your word. Do not let my inabilities, do not let my weaknesses change what you would have said. Make real the truth to each heart, each soul, each person. Father, I pray for any that are hearing these words that are not saved. I pray that you will touch them, Father, with your word. You will show them what's coming. You will tell them how to avoid that. You will tell them how to find Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit will quicken them to come to Christ. They will repent. They will confess. They will accept. And they will be saved. Father, I plead to keep the Holy Spirit working, calling others. Keep the restraining hand on evil until it's time for you to take the restraining hand off. And Father, I thank you. I thank you for knowing that I will spend eternity with you, Father, worshiping you, loving you, Father. I give you all the thanks and the glory forever and ever. Amen.